Hi. Welcome to our Ask Nurse Linda live web chat. I am Julie Lubinsky. I am Web Production Manager for the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you all today. Um, so we continue the discussion with our free monthly webcast. We have Linda Schultz. She is a leader and a provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation for close to 20. Within our online community, she writes about and she answers your questions um, that are uh, paralysis-related healthcare questions in her Ask a Nurse discussion forum on our online community. And just to let you know that this is designed to be a discussion amongst community members, not a lecture or a simple question and answer. So we definitely want you to ask your questions. You, if you are on the web portion, you may type your question in the chat box. Um, if you are on the phone, you may hit star six to mute and star six to unmute as well um, to mute or to mute again. And we um, will pause and ask if there's any questions that you'd like. If anybody's able to speak, uh, it's on the phone or can speak um, through the microphone on the computer, we'll give you a chance then. So I would like to turn it over to Linda to start us off. Well, Hi, thank Linda. you, Julie. And it's just uh, wonderful to be here again today. I hope that everybody is doing well. There's been a series of posts on the blog um, this month, and it's all about some complications that happen of, uh, to people or, or could possibly happen um, for people who have paralysis. Um, so I'll just briefly go over those real quickly, and then I see we already have some questions, so we'll turn to those next. But first of all, the topics that have been brought up are about complications. And I know sometimes it just feels like, oh gosh, all we ever hear about is complications and, and there's all these, just these different problems and you know, it seems like it's kind of oppressive on us all the time. But let me assure you, this, these are things that can happen to anyone, whether you have paralysis or whether you don't. And so that's why I thought it would be kind of interesting to group these all together because the treatment for all of them, well, there's various treatments, but one of the treatment threads that runs through all of these complications is exercise. And we all know that exercise is very difficult to accomplish in one's daily life. And that really, again, is for everyone. You know, we see a lot of people who join gyms, you know, with their New Year's resolution in January. And then, you know, we, as a consumer, we're told just wait until February because the gyms are so crowded with the people with New Year's resolutions. But by February, everybody's dropped out, so it goes back to normal again. So this is just an issue that everybody has because exercise can be kind of um, tedious at times, but it certainly is good and healthy for us to move our bodies in some way. So some of the issues that I have brought up in this month in particular, the first one being orthostatic hypotension, which is um, something that people have usually at, right after their injury and they first start to get up in that their autonomic nervous system has a hard time regulating the blood pressure. So when we go to rise from a seated or a lying down position, um, our autonomic nervous system will help force our blood pressure, constrict our vessels, so that more blood goes to our head so we don't get dizzy when we get up. So if we have problems with our autonomic nervous system, we can, uh, those blood vessels won't constrict and so people kind of get dizzy and faint. Uh, when, the, when they try to change positions. But as I say, this can happen to almost anyone. Sometimes people will have a fractured leg. They go into the hospital to have their legs set, and when the first time they go to get up, they feel a little woozy. Or sometimes they're just people who are just out living their life with really no health concerns at all, and they suddenly stand up, but maybe for some reason they're a little dehydrated for what, whatever's going on in their life that day. And they think, whoa, I'm a little dizzy. And, you know, they sit right back down until their body kind of stabilizes itself. So, um, but, so orthostatic hypertension tends to resolve for most people. 
as they move away from their injury date and they start recovering from their spinal cord injury. But for some people, it will take quite a long time for that to resolve. So there's some strategies to use um, uh, regarding hypostat orthostatic hypotension um, in that particular blog, one of which is exercise to get that blood flowing and moving again. Um, pain is another one. Again, there's a lot of treatments for pain. And there's a lot of questions that come in periodically about the blog. So that's a good refresher on pain management. Again, sometimes it's kind of counterintuitive to think about. I hurt, so I don't want to move. But moving sometimes helps relieve and kind of unclog those muscles. Um, diabetes is another one that is a lot of people control adult onset diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, through diet and exercise. And then, of course, osteoporosis, which is uh, loss of minerals in the bones. And another treatment for that is exercise. So in a little bit, we're going to talk more about exercise, I hope. And I hope that um, while I answer some questions that are presented here, on the blog, because I know those people are anxious to get answers to their questions. But I hope that you'll think about exercise, and we'll talk about some ways that people can um, exercise, even though they have paralysis of any type. And so um, think about things that you're doing, and feel free to submit those ideas, or if you want to talk about the exercise plan that you have, be sure and bring those up, because sometimes people are doing things, and it seems so natural to them, and you mention it on a webinar or you talk to other people, and maybe other people haven't thought of it. So you might hold the key to that um, exercise conundrum that we're all in. So think about those things, and then let's go ahead and look at some of the questions on the blog site that have been typed in. And we have a gentleman first on who's uh, um, our first uh, uh, questionnaire today. Um, and so this gentleman is representing someone um, with a C1 quadriplegia. Uh, and he's asking about, is uh, does anyone use FES cycling for the upper arms? And yes, um, there certainly is FES cycling that can be done for the upper arms. It's usually done um, with a little, uh, a smaller stimulator because the nerves in the arms are smaller. Um, now there are devices that you can use like um, the FES bicycles that use larger stimulation because you're stimulating those big muscles in the legs. And so a real good um, technique for that is to get one of these bicycles so as your legs are being stimulated, your arms can be put in some troughs, and so they will also be stimulated. But you can have direct electrical stimulation to the arms. And then you can use one of the, um, you know, these little um, bike exercises that people use. You know, sometimes they have people use them in their office. They're just like little pedaling machines. Unfortunately, they, even though they're, they have no electrical power to them, they still cost a lot of money. But you can get one of those, put some arm troughs on it. Instead of pedaling with your legs, um, you can pedal with your arms. And sometimes people have these machines. They're advertised a lot on the computer. They're advertised a lot on TV where people have these little like peddler device machines. I've seen some of the less expensive ones are about $150. I saw one advertised just this morning for $130. And um, they don't have any power to them. You power, power them on your own. But if you have the electrodes and the device for the arm stimulation, you can hook those up and use, hook your arms up to those so you can pedal with your arms on those. There are, of course, more advanced machines that will have um, the stimulation all built in. So um, either of those would work fine. Sometimes people use the little stimulators to stimulate the muscles, but they don't use the repetitive movement, and that helps also stimulate those muscles. So um, that's going to come into play um, further on. I was kind of reading ahead. And so the second part to this question is that I think it's the same person was asking about um, uh, some uh, external bone growth in the arms, extra bone growth in both elbows. 
So that's why I wanted to talk about the two the differences in these two FES arm stimulation devices because um, that extra bone growth in the arm is some, it's another complication. It's called heterotrophic ossification. Those are pretty big words, but if you want to Google that to get more information, you can put in H dot O dot. That's the medical abbreviation for heterotrophic ossification. And you can type that into Google, just put H dot O dot, you know, H period, O period, and um, then type in NSCI, and you'll get a lot of information about that. And so what happens is sometimes when our, our bones aren't used, our bones are constantly um, replenishing themselves. You know, we all know about skin replenishing itself and that um, we have, um, as our skin is always recycling itself, so new skin cells are, are born and, and your skin is constantly turning over. And the same thing happens in our bones. It happens in all of our organs. It happens in our brain and spinal cord too. So we get new nerve cells in our spinal cord, which is going to be important in our, in our recovery from spinal cord injury. Um, now, in the, in the brain and spinal cord, it happens at a painfully slow rate. When you're waiting for recovery, you certainly want that to happen faster, but it's extremely slow. But it does happen, which is the key of importance there. So in our bones, sometimes they're replenishing themselves. We're laying down new bones, keeping our bones strong. But when we're not putting weight through those bones, sometimes the replenishing of the bones, so to speak, doesn't quite know what to do with itself and it tends to spread out into the muscle tissue. So you actually get bone growing in your muscle tissue. Um, there's a medication that you can take to help reduce that from happening and it's called Originate and you can find it when you look up the HO. So there's a medication that can be taken to reduce that. Sometimes that bone growth around the joint mm -hmm gets into the muscles and it gets the muscles get so hard with bone growth that you actually have to have um, surgery to remove that bone growth. When you remove the bone growth, you also are removing muscles. So you want to get on top of that before you get to that um, point in life where you have to have something so extremely done. So you want to really be on top of this, start taking the medication, um, start doing this um, start doing some kind of exercise that will put uh, weight through your bones. And the good way to do that is through the FES cycling. So I can almost see this conversation going on in Australia with the extra bone growth and let's try some FES cycling and you know let's get more information about this. So you see it's all it all fits together and it's you know great advice from what you've gotten from your physical therapist. Now the issue here is to have the x-ray to see how much external bone growth that there is because you don't want to start moving bones that are fused together because that's, they're not going to move. But one of the first things, if, so if the bone growth is not too bad and the joint's still freely moving, you can do the FES cycling. Um, you want to just be sure and check to make sure that everything is free and clear to do that. So that's going to be very important. If you can't do the FES cycling, so if you can't do the rhythmic motion of your arms on the cycle, you can still do the FES uh, portion, which will put, um, it, it supplies that electricity to the muscle. So the muscle and the nerves are actually working, and as the muscle contracts and relaxes, it's um, you know working that muscle, but it's also pulling that tendon that's attaching that muscle to the bone. So that's going to give some of that input to help reduce this uh, HO, the heterotrophic ossification, for to keep the bone from growing out into the muscle. So you can kind of see how this is all formulating together, but you have to be very careful before you start one of these therapies that you're not going to do more harm than good. So um, that's where I was going with all of that. Um, so let's, let's move on and see what else. Oh, and then the other thing is spasms. And um, the FES is basically a high-level form of exercise. So if you can't move on your own, that will provide exercise to the uh, muscles. And then um, yeah. 
that should reduce some of the spasticity. Now, range of motion will help with the spasticity. Um, so, you know, just your normal stretching exercises will help with that. But the FES will also help with that. So um, the bone, extra bone growth in the muscles can increase because you've got agitation there. So that can increase some of the spasticity. So if you see the spasticity getting um, more and more uh, strong or you, know, you see more and more development of spasticity and you have the extra bone growth, probably the cause. At the C1 level, you're going to have to worry about um, dysreflexia, autonomic dysreflexia. AD, we talk a lot about, about that. So you can have some problems uh, with your blood pressure and with some of the uh, flushing and stuffy nose and that sort of thing due to autonomic dysreflexia from the bone growth, but also the FES treatment can also stimulate some of that, especially if you have the combination of the HO and you start the, the um, FES cycling. So you just want to be monitored very carefully for that sort of thing. So just make sure you know, you know you're ready for any other complications that, so you know, sometimes the treatment causes other complications. So you should be, you now know all the things you need to know about that, so that should be, and you should be in good shape to be prepared for that. Um, we have another question about what kind of bed do you recommend for C5-6 quad and pressure sores are concerned which pressure sores are always a concern for anyone with paralysis. And yes, uh, prices do vary, and uh, will Medicare cover this? An available uh, adjustable bed is a must. Um, so yes, um, there are many different kinds of um, pressure reduction mattresses. Unfortunately, there is no mattress or cushion or any kind of pressure relieving device that you're going to use that is going to eliminate your risk for pressure sores. Whenever you're on any kind of surface, you have the potential to develop a pressure sore. So no matter what type of surface that you're using for your mattress, there's still going to have to be turning that's going to be done and repositioning um, you know, throughout different periods. Uh, as you build up your skin tolerance, you can go for longer periods, but um, even still, like during a nighttime period, there's still going to have to be turning that goes on. So there's a variety of kinds, and um, um, Medicare has some limitations on what they do cover. This is the unfortunate thing, is that sometimes um, we know that there's a complication, like pressure sores can develop. And so it, you would think that um, insurance would say, well, gee, uh, pressure sores are very detrimental to patients' health and their happiness in life and their quality of life, and they're also uh, expensive to heal. And so you would think that people would say, well, let's start out with the top of the line so that we, we don't have any pressure ulcers that will arise. But they also know that there's nothing that will completely eliminate the risk of a pressure sore. And so um, um, Medicare will authorize certain levels of equipment then after you have a pressure sore, then they'll authorize a higher level of equipment. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but this is the way that insurance and any kind of payer, this is kind of the way that they think. Um, so uh, what, would you, what would you want to do? Well, you want to get some kind of uh, pressure uh, reduction mattress. A lot of it will depend on the size of the patient and then how much uh, musculature they have on their body. So people who are more prone to pressure ulcers are people who are extremely thin because they don't have much, much muscle mass or people who are heavier because they have so much fat. And the reason why um, this is because you, you would think they have more cushion, and, but the reason why this is is because when you have a lot of fat in your tissues, um, that tends to constrict. It doesn't distribute the pressure like a muscle will distribute the pressure. Okay, so let's think about this. You see on TV 
um, on the Dr. Scholl's uh, commercials, you can get inserts for your shoes. And you can go to the store and you can stand on a little machine and it will give you a pressure mapping. Now maybe some of you listeners have had pressure mapping of your body because you can physical therapists can do this of, of your whole body to tell you where your pressure points are. And where your pressure points are always at your bony prominences. So it's where your bones are closest to the surface of your skin. So a good example is that hip joint right there or the, um, the sacrum, which is, is at the top of the gluteal fold on, the, on your rear end. That's where your bones are closest on the surface. Now your elbows, your shoulders, those, you know, they're all the, the same. They have the same classification of bony prominences. So these are the uh, things that, that you, your heels, your knees, these are all the spots where you want to protect the most. And most people also forget that they'll get a, a pressure-reducing mattress, but they have their head on a pillow, which is not pressure-reducing. It just flattens out. As you know, a pillow will just flatten out, which will cause more constriction like on your ear or in the back of your head where your bones are also close to the surface. So if you get up, uh, if you have the need for a pressure reduction mattress, you also want to look into a pressure reduction pillow because you don't want to lose sight. We get a lot of patients um, who, you know, have their spine stabilization surgery. They've been in the OR and they'll come out of the OR with a pressure ulcer on the back of their head because their body has been protected but their head has not been protected because people forget that little piece of the puzzle there. So is there any particular um, kind? Well, there's a lot of different kinds. Um, the gel the gel cushions are good. Um, you want to get something that allows the air to circulate between you, so you don't want to get a, a plastic or vinyl kind of thing. Uh, there's a company called Rojo. I'm not recommending any one company, but their product is so different in that it has like these little finger-like projections so that you can rotate your body, but you're in a different um, the pressure is on, the pressure on your skin is in a different spot every time you move or turn your body. So um, there's also some mattresses that will some bed frames that will rotate the mattress from side to side so that you're kind of sort of turned and your pressure areas turn. Um, but there again, uh, will Medicare cover these things? Uh, probably not until you run into problems, which you don't want to run into problems. So um, usually the, pre the pressure reduction surface, in hospital lingo we call mattresses surfaces because, you know, that's just another complication to the puzzle, I guess. But um, so any kind of mattress that you get um, is, separ is a separate purchase from the bed frame. So you can get a bed frame of any kind that's adjustable, you know, if you want the automatic uh, head up kind of thing if you want the bed to rise up and down for easier transferring. Um, that bed frame is will be one item and then the, the mattress is a separate item. So you can mix and match. You can get an adjustable bed frame that um, will be able to be used uh, with a variety of bed surfaces or mattresses. So you just want to check to make sure that they're compatible, but usually um, the mattress is, um, is um, made poss possibly by a completely different company than the bed frame itself. Most uh, hospital beds make different uh, pressure reduction bed surfaces, and, but um, you still have to do the turning nonetheless. And then um, moving on here, um, Oh, there's a question about self-calf. And this uh, person says they've had no more than one UTI in a year, but this year is different. She said three. Um, should I visit my urologist? And this is something um, that is a kind of an interesting conundrum. So um, this is this is one of life's little factors. And I don't I don't know how old you are. Um, that's written in this question, but oftentimes uh, women as they get older get more prone towards UTIs. 
um, than they have been in the past due to hormonal change changes in uh, their urinary tract. And so as your uh, estrogen and your hormones change, if you become perimenopausal, sometimes you, women have a higher chance of getting UTIs. Um, you want to look at your whole system. Um, I don't have a lot of information to, to use here, but as our fashions change, even getting into our our fashion choices, uh, sometimes if we're wearing, you know, right now the the fashion for pants and um, jeans are these um, uh, uh, jeggings. You know, the kids call them jeggings. And they look like jeans, but they're kind of stretch fabric, but they don't really stretch that much. Um, some of these um, pants that uh, women wear that are, um, you know, very uh, body conscious, these tend to constrict um, and don't breathe very well. So um, women tend to have more t UTIs that are wearing those kind of um, garments if you have looser uh, cotton-oriented clothes, cotton underwear as opposed to nylon or the silky underpanties, that tends to help um, look at your equipment um, if you have a new job or you're in a new place. Um, so anyway, something has happened that has caused this change in the number of the UTIs. So we need to look at, is it something in the physiology? Um, do you happen to have... Um, an infection, a vaginal infection that maybe you're unaware of, or you know, uh, changes in your hormonal levels, or um, even a change in anything that could change your uh, body chemistry. So, if you're not drinking as much as you were, or perhaps you're drinking more um, sugary sodas, can increase your risk of getting UTIs. Diet sodas, if you've added that to your diet. Um, drinking cranberry juice leaves your urine uh, more acidic. Drinking orange juice leaves your urine more alkaline, which tends to breed more infections. So review your diet also. Think about if you're taking in enough water. Um, and just look at everything that you can do. So should, should you see your urologist, well, with such a change, yes, you probably should because that's a significant change in your health care. And you don't want to you know, just keep having UTI after UTI because you're going to be taking more and more antibiotics and then you're going to be resistant and have to take higher level of antibiotics. So, you know, yes, you should see your urologist. Now, if you're using just a straight cast that you clean yourself, if you have three UTIs within a certain time frame, your insurance will usually up you to uh, be able to use uh, sterile, in, in, sterile catheters, a new catheter, every single time. If you're not already using those, you probably fit the qualifications to up your catheterization system. So I would, I would go to the urologist. I would look at um, if I've changed my, uh, even down to if I've changed my clothing, have I changed, we were just talking about surfaces. Did you get a new cushion that maybe the air is not circulating uh, where you're sitting as much and so things are becoming more moist there? And then look at your diet and um, the amount of fluid that you're taking. But this is an easily correctable problem once you isolate um, the source of the problem. Um, this particular blogger also has um, another problem with keeping her legs warm even in the summer, and uh, it has to do with circulation or lack thereof. And, and probably you've played right into our cue today of exercise. So it's, um, yeah, it's um, lack of movement is probably what's um, causing that uh, circulation problem. So if you are um, able to stretch out at different points in the day, if you have any kind of exercise routine that you're doing, that will help you. Um, of course, um, if you want to, you know, put on a warm pair of socks, I know it's the summertime and, you, you know, you'll want to check and not overheat yourself, but you want to protect yourself um, from the sun. Or if you want to, you know, just try to keep your body warmer with some warm socks, sometimes that will help. 
But probably the thing that's going to do you the most good is to get some kind of movement or exercise in your legs. And you can do that even by just uh, using a standing frame to put some weight through your legs and also stretching. So when your legs are feeling cold, if you can range of motion your legs, stretch out your legs, that's going to help get that circulation going. Now, if you've had a sudden change in, in your legs, you want to be sure and check to see if you have a, a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. Since you have it in both legs and not just one leg, it probably is not that. But you still want to check to make sure that um, you know your pulses are good in your legs, that you don't have any red streaks on your legs, or that there isn't um, some blood vessels that look like they're dilating at a certain point, so that you could you know you usually can't see a blood clot. But since it's an overall problem, it most likely is not that. But we always have to think about these things, even um, in talking about that. So um, probably um, the best thing is to think about stretching or moving or adding some kind of exercise to your lower extremities, and that really is going to help relieve that problem. Um, I'm not quite sure where are the donuts. I do not know where the donuts. Oh, are you talking about um, are you talking about the donuts for? Um, Seating surfaces, because we've gotten, if, you, if you're talking about the donuts that you eat, I'm all for it, let's have one, but there's none here. Um, if you're talking about the donuts that people used to sit on for pressure release, um, we've got, kind of gotten rid of those years and years ago. And the reason for uh, not using a donut, you can still buy them in the stores because people who have hemorrhoids, um, sometimes we'll sit on a donut pillow. If you have any kind of paralysis, you really do not ever want to use a donut pillow. Because it is a ring, it's, it is an automatic pressure inducer. So as you sit on that donut, as you sit on that ring, you're causing constriction of your blood vessels and you're causing an increase in your risk of uh, pressure uh, sore. So they tend to, donut pillows tend to constrict your vessels and draw all the blood to that one central area or the hole in the donut. And so it tends to not let the blood circulate. So they're constrictors as opposed to what you want is pressure reducers, which is a, um, uh, a pressure surface uh, that will distribute the pressure if you're sitting throughout your whole buttocks as opposed to just on the uh, bony prominences as you're sitting. So that's where the donuts have gone. So I think that's what it's about. Um, so let's see. Um, going on down. Uh, oh, we're back in Australia. And uh, the gentleman has an FES cycle here at home. And um, can he use the large size FES that he has for his arms? Would it require smaller pads? And yes, um, it not only would require smaller pads, but it would require uh, different programming. So the stimulation that you put on those big old muscles in your legs is quite a bit of difference than what you put on the muscles in your arms significantly amount of difference in such that usually the FES bikes don't even program to arm size. So you're probably looking at a whole different device, but you can get FES stimulators, little they're about the size if you remember the old transistor radios. They're really um, tiny little devices, and they um, run actually off a battery as opposed to getting all that power from an outlet in the wall. And the um, pads are much, much smaller, but the uh, program, the, the electrical requirement is much, much smaller. So you can get one of those uh, little FES arm stimulation devices and you will do much better than trying to use the bike. It usually does not equate. I don't know what kind of bike you have, but usually they do not equate. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so um, 
We have a totally different question here. We have somebody who has a T7 paraplegia, and, and, and they happen to have an anal fistula, and will it heal by itself? So um, will the anal fistula heal by itself? Probably not. Um, it might uh, close itself off at some point, but there's probably some intervention that you're going to have to do. So you're either going to have to have some kind of, um, on, the, on the most optimistic, you might be able to do some kind of packing and do a, a, a kind of a pseudo wound change to that kind of thing, but usually you need to see um, a specialist who, um, a GI surgeon who maybe doesn't have to do surgery, they might be able to do some cauterization or they might be able to do something else. The problem with anal fistulas is because our gut, our whole gut from our mouth down to our rectum is a dirty area. It's not sterile. It has all kinds of bacteria in it. Now, our urinary system is sterile, but our gut is not sterile at all. So what happens with the anal fistulas is they keep reinfecting themselves and so it's, it's not really significantly hard, but it's more difficult because of all the bacteria there. So um, it would be a good idea to see somebody to, to get that healed up. See uh, where it's tracking. So the anal fistula is starting at one place, but then the next question is, where is it going? And so you want to be sure and have that checked out because you don't want it draining into a sterile place. So if the anal fistula is connected to your bladder, then you have significant issues because the bladder is sterile, but the rectum is not. And so you'll have bacteria going into your bladder, which is going to go up into your kidneys, which have to remain sterile. So um, yeah, you would really want to have that checked in. Okay, um, so we, um, back, we're back in Australia, and so um, our, our fellow there is having FES bike and hydrotherapy, which is great exercise, and so both of those are really good for stimulation. He's already got some reduced range of motion in the arm, so you know, they're just going to have to be very careful there in Australia um, to see how they're going to start the FES in the arm, and you don't want to just you know, get a device and start that. You re really want to be sure. You want to see if you can get on some of the medic medication to reduce the HO. Um, maybe you can, it might be possible to do some FES arm stimulation um, with a limited range of motion, but you're going to have to really have a, somebody who knows what they're doing, a real professional, look into that before you start because m m the odds are more likely that you should just be doing the range of motion to the arm manually as opposed to applying the electrical stimulation. So I just caution you on that. Be sure to um, check with somebody. Um, let's see. Um, Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, here's a wonderful uh, comment we have from somebody um, that was doing FES at uh, Kenny Courage in the Twin Cities and help reverse uh, their osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is one of our topics this month, and it is a complication that people get when they lose the mineralization in their bones. So our bones look like... Um, they, lo they look like a very thick web. The, our bones have little tiny microscopic holes in them. And when they lose the mineral, when we lose the minerals in the bones, these holes get bigger. So this, you know, what looks like a solid piece of bone, when you see it on TV or you see a picture of a bone, it looks like a solid uh, piece of bone, but it actually has little tiny microscopic holes all throughout it. And this is just the way, you know, because you've got to have blood circulation, there's a lot of things going on in the bones, and you've got to be able to get in the center of the bone is where new bone cells are made, and they have to get to the outer edges of the bones. They travel through these little microscopic cells. So when, when the minerals aren't able to do that, they're not able to replenish the bone, these, these, whole, these microscopic holes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what happens then is the bone becomes too weak to be able to hold our body weight. And sometimes they get so thin 
that the bones get so uh, delicate that just the process of just picking up a leg and moving it to reposition it in the bed, the bone will just break because there's just not anything strong enough to hold it together. So when that happens, because the bones are so thin, the only way that you're really going to be able to heal that bone is to go in and have surgery and put a plate in. Now you have to put a plate in and it's fastened at each end and by screws, which needs to go into solid bone. But these little microscopic holes, it's not like a, a fracture of a bone where you just have a clean fracture and there's just a break in that one spot. So you have in osteoporosis, you have these little microscopic holes throughout the bone, so it's hard to find a place to screw in the plate. Now, some people in the community are having the experience where they're having a bone fracture, and um, people are saying, well, you know, you don't walk on the bone, uh, so probably, you know, you don't need to have it anything done with it, um, you know, we'll just leave it as is. Well, you know, your body still recognizes that there's some problem because we have all kinds of feedback going. We might not feel the pain of the break of that bone, but our body's still going to react to it. So just as if you get a pressure ulcer, say, on your ankle or on your heel, you might not feel that it's there, but your body's still going to react to it. Same thing if you uh, have a higher level injury and you have a, an appendicitis. You might not feel that you have a pain in your abdomen, but your body's still going to react to it. So you still need to have something done uh, to help with that bone. And then also, as there's so much going on right now with recovery and spinal cord injury, you don't want to leave something unattended because it might have... Um, an effect on your life further down the road. So as you know right now, there's a study going on being uh, funded by the Christopher and Dana Reef Paralysis Foundation in planting stimulators. Um, you think of the FES bicycling. It's like implanting one of those stimulators right into the spinal cord. Into, in, and so um, they're having some wonderful outcomes with that right now. Now, the reason we need to be you know, watchful of this, we need to make sure that those continue. But they're getting some excellent results, and there are also other studies that are going on around the country where people are having wonderful results for treatment of spinal cord injury. So we really want to be sure that we keep our bodies in working order so that we're ready when these treatments come because it's not, it's not that far off, my friends. Um, every day I know that you have a spinal cord injury. It probably seems like it. it's a million miles away, but we're getting closer and closer. So um, this uh, reader writes in that they got FES, and a lot of FES uh, is in the in the mainstream of payers now. So you can get FES treatments. Um, I'm, I cannot say that every payer will do that. Certainly Medicaid is a little bit more on the hesitant side. But you can get things like standing frames. That's an activity that you can do, and most payers will pay at least for a standing frame. If you can get some of the electrical stimulation, go through those programs. That is going to be just fabulous for you, and this helped reverse this, pay, this fellow's osteoporosis because what it does is that that muscle, the muscles and the nerves are stimulated from the outside of the body and electrodes placed on the muscle, and then that muscle contracts and relaxes, contracts and relaxes. So usually what they have people do is pedal a bike because it gives that repetitive, repetitive, repetitive feedback to the spinal cord, which is uh, reconditioning your spinal cord to learn that, that this is what your body should be doing. This is the way your body should be reacting. So your brain knows what to do. The area below your spinal cord injury still works. It's just not getting the, the, um, the message to the particular muscle to contract and, and relax. So it still works. It's just not getting the message to make it work. So in FES, the message is supplied 
through electrical stimulation through uh, the skin, an electrical current is placed, and that muscle is then working. As the muscle expands and contracts, um, it contracts and relaxes, it's pulling on the tendons, which is pulling on the bones, which is giving you your bones the same feedback that um, you're walking or you're using your legs in some way. So it's putting weight through those bones, which is helping to put the minerals in the right spot. So this is quite, you know, it's it's been demonstrated that this um, absolutely works with counteracting the secondary um, complications of spinal cord injury, and here we have a good testimonial of that. So if you can if you can find a way to get to one of these programs, it's a good good opportunity. Um, I, I kind of lost track. I kind of lost track where we were on that. Um, the staff are trained to recognize those symptoms. I'm assuming we're back in Australia with the AD or the HO. And uh, so um, that the FES sections could trigger it. Um, the FES sections could trigger, I think we're talking about AD. So FES can trigger AD until you become accustomed to it. So you need to, you know, you can't just, you know, just, just as if, um, I were going to get up today and say, I'm going to go run a 10K marathon. Well, I can't just get up from my chair and go run a 10K marathon because I'm not trained or in condition for that. Oh, would I love to be? But, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not in any kind of condition for that. Most people aren't. You have to build up to these things. So FES is an exercise program, so you need to build up for things and you can't just start out on them and say, okay, let's power up the guns and see how it goes. So you have to build up to these things. Okay, so the question, the next question is on wounds and uh, how to prevent breaking down after healing and is there anything uh, that they can put on the skin to help it make strong, uh, for example, vitamin E ointment? Well, this is the thing. Once you've had a wound and then it heals, a scar is formed. And scars are never as elastic as our original skin. They're uh, uh, certainly a good uh, system. It's the way our, our skin works, and it's a good system. But once you have a wound, you're at a lot higher risk of having a second wound in the same spot, and that is because of uh, the elasticity. So um, you can put a lotion, or in this particular case, she wonders about vitamin E ointment, any, of, any kind of... Um, uh, emollient that you put on your skin is going to make it more supple and so that's a good thing but really what people have found is it's not necessarily the ointment or the lotion that you put on the skin but it's the massaging of the skin and um, when you massage the skin having some lubricant to help you do that helps um, encourage that now I so that being said let me point out another thing when you uh, massage your skin you're putting pressure between your skin and probably that bony prominence where you first broke down. So if you have a scar on your arm, sometimes we will tell people to massage it because that will break down some of the scar tissue and that, that would help. So if it was just on your arm, yes. Um, if you have a pressure ulcer that has healed but it's been over a bony prominence, you might not want to be massaging it because you're adding more pressure. You're, pinpointing that particular piece of skin, you're rubbing it around in a circle, and you're putting pressure on right on that bony prominence that so you're adding to it. So um, could you, you know, like dabble on some ointment that might help soften it? Uh, it doesn't hurt. I don't know that there's any evidence that it's going to help, but it might make you feel better or, you know, it might it might make you think that you're helping it in some way. It might make it more supple. But you don't want to apply a pressure like, um, you know, like if you're having a back massage and you know that, that pressure that you really apply during a massage. So you might want to uh, put some ointment on there just to help soften the skin, but don't rub it really so hard. 
So um, massage over a wound. We used to actually do that, but that's grown out of fashion because we know that we're just adding more pressure onto that particular area. Um, let's see, our time is growing short. And so um, uh, let's see. Oh, our person with the three UTIs is um, age 62. So probably um, the menopause issue is probably resolved itself, although there's still some complications um, as women go through menopause. So you might want to um, um, think about, uh, just look at all the risk factors for developing those UTIs and um, just uh, think about what might be going on. But go ahead and see your uro urologist, but certainly go through the laundry list that I gave you to see if there's anything that you can do that you know might solve your problem yourself. And so, uh, oh, <laughs> I bet a guy with a donut. <laughs> it was just a joke while he was waiting to start. Well, thank you, but anyway, nonetheless, uh, oh, anything could be answered by Nurse Linda. Boy, I tell you, I really was stretching my brain for that donut joke. But okay, that's really good. But you brought up a good thing, a good point, because, like I said, some people are out in areas where maybe they don't have um, uh, access to um, assistance by people with. Uh, Spinal cord injury is their specialty, and so you know it's when I when I go into the clinic, I am, I always am kind of uh, amazed at the wonderful things that people have thought of, but then I'm also kind of amazed at things that um, healthcare professionals have told people to do, and I'll be like, well, gee, you know, that kind of went out in the dark ages. So um, anyway, it was a good thing to bring up because somebody might be sitting on a, a donut pillow and we might have saved them from some, uh, uh, we might have stay, saved them from uh, some kind of trouble. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, there's an add-on and a, uh, a bike. There's a bike company. I'm familiar with that bike company, and it has an add-on for the ex for the upper extremity. And so um, some people have done that now, um, and some people are still um, working on that. So uh, let's see um, if there's anything else that we can answer real quickly. In the oh, okay. So um, okay, good. So. Getting back to the original question, what are you doing for exercise? And now I know if you have a really high level injury, it's going to be very difficult uh, to do some exercise. And so I, you know, I can see the eyes rolling uh, over the telephone here. But if you have somebody who can help you stretch out your muscles, if you can get involved in the FES exercise, you're really going to be um, really uh, doing a good benefit, a good service for yourself because you're going to keep your joints and muscles supple so that um, not only are you going to reduce your chance of having these secondary uh, complications, but you're actually um, going to be keeping yourself in a uh, prime position. For some of the cardiac patients that I see, um, they really can't walk, but they have movement in their extremities, but they really can't walk far. And their exercise is just to stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. So exercise comes in a variety of ways. And, and we have one uh, person who's written in, get in the habit of moving, sliding, leaning forwards and backwards sliding forwards and backwards, just pushing around for a minute. And that is exactly the point. Anything that you're doing, you're wheeling around in your wheelchair. So while you're doing that, um, you know, just don't go from point A to point B, but think about, I need to go for a little wheelchair stroll. So as you can see, we're talking a lot about the upper extremities. And I just ran across an article today um, in regards to upper extremity uh, exercise and diabetes, which is one of our uh, secondary complications. And for a long time, it was kind of, well, maybe you could uh, help your blood sugar levels by um, doing some upper extremity arm exercises, but you really need to do the lower extremity exercises. Well, there's a really tightly done piece of research where they have demonstrated that you can use your up, the muscles in your upper arms, and remember they're much smaller, 
But you, effectively exercising your upper arms can also help reduce uh, the increase in uh, sugar metabolism and the increase in insulin production. So now we have some evidence that's demonstrating that. So all of these exercises that the reader's talking about, get in the habit of moving, sliding, leaning forward, leaning backwards, draping your torso if you can over the side of your chair. These are all pressure reduction exercises too. So you're not only going to help yourself through exercise, but you are also going to be helping yourself um, avoid some of these secondary complications. So... Um, Uh, oh, we have a reader that um, is at T10 and is getting a signal when his bladder needs to be cast and is getting spasms in the legs. Uh, is this common? Well, at, uh, it is and it isn't. At T10, it's not unheard of. But some people actually who have these lower uh, thoracic injuries will have um, some signals like this because you're getting close down to the lumbar area and maybe something has been spared there. But some people actually are able to direct their whole uh, bladder program uh, using these kind of signals. Um, unfortunately, it sometimes comes with severe pain. So I hope that that pain doesn't come to later and you start paying attention to those spasms and think, gee, I need to get in and catheterize. But you still kind of need to watch the clock because you don't want to go over six hours without catheterization. Um, now, some people go at eight hours at night and that's okay. But during the day when you're actually taking in fluids, you don't want to go over six hours because you don't want that collecting, overstretching, and that's what's causing those spasms is that your bladder is starting to overstretch and so it's letting your body know in the only way it can. So um, just, uh, you know, see how that plays out, but it's, it's not that unheard of. And I think I'm starting to get the signal that I'm, I'm talking on and on. My This hour just went by so quickly for me. So I hope that I've answered most of your questions. If I haven't gotten to them and you want to write into the blog, that would be just great. And uh, we'll look forward to more next month. Yes, thank you, Nurse Linda, um, for um, talking for that full hour. And we will let you get a glass of water and take a breather. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, and encourage you to read Nurse Linda's posts and ask questions in our online community at ChristopherReeve.org slash nurse. And this presentation is being recorded and it will be available by the end of the week at ChristopherReeve.org slash webcasts. So I would love to um, have you all join us again uh, next month for the next chat live with Nurse Linda. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.